Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, on the cross, uttered those words. Other than, of course, it is finished, I thirst, that kind of stuff. Turn in your authorized version of the scriptures to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27, verses 45 on to verse 50. Please follow me along in the scriptures we will be looking at today. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Some of them that stood there when they heard that said, This man calleth for Elias, Elijah. And straightway one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink. The rest said, Let be, let us see whether Elias will come to save him. Now, this is also, the, uh, an account of this is also given in Mark chapter 15, it's the same account. There is a difference in book, uh, Mark 15, it says Eloi, Eloi. Well, here it says Eli, Eli. It's the same event, the same thing. I personally think um, Eloi versus Eli is simply a matter of pronunciation, uh, not a contradiction whatsoever. But our Lord on the cross, so one of the few things that he did say on the cross, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why hast thou forsaken me? Turn in the authorized version of the scriptures to Psalm 22. Because Psalms do not have chapters, do they? Psalm 22. Psalm 22. We're going to be doing a little expository here uh, this morning. It is still morning, almost. <laughs> but uh, we're going to be doing a little expository here. Not too in-depth, but we are going to be doing some. Um, in Psalm 22, we're going to read this entire psalm. Please follow me along. Why did our Lord say that upon the cross? Why? Let's read. Psalm 22. Beginning at verse 1. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me, and from the words of my roaring? Now, why didn't our Lord say the rest of that? And not to, you know, he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But on the cross he didn't say the rest of it, didn't complete the verse. Why? Obviously, because he knew why he was on the cross, to make an atonement for sin. As it says in the book of Gen uh, Genesis, uh, chapter 22, verse 8, God will provide himself a lamb for burnt offering. Himself a lamb. Okay? Uh, our Lord Jesus Christ knew why he was on the cross. To die, bury, and raise again the third day according to the scriptures, and to shed his blood to make an atonement for sin. To be the perfect sacrifice to wash sin away. Where the blood of bulls and goats could only cover. While the blood of God himself, the Father, washes it away. See, So he knew why he was on the cross. But here in Psalm 22, which our Lord did quote. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But in that verse, why art thou so far from helping me? And from the war and from the words of my roaring. Hmm, could you say just begin with the beginning of the psalm? That and this is a psalm of David, that David at this moment was feeling forsaken, all alone, helpless, hopeless, all dignity and all manner of Rights and respect taken from him? Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not. 
and in the night season, and am not silent. But thou art holy, separate, other than. O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel, our fathers trusted in thee, they trusted, and thou didst deliver them. They cried unto thee, and were delivered. They trusted in thee, and were not confounded. Verse 6. But I am a worm, and no man, a reproach of men, and despised of the people. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip, they shake the head, saying, He trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. So David in this psalm is obviously being mocked. Hmm, you don't say. Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53. Thank you, Lord. Verses 2 on a verse 4. Isaiah chapter 53. Now let's read verses 1 on to verse 4. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Referring unto our Lord Jesus Christ himself, God our Father. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, look at this, there is no beauty that we should desire him. You know, the effeminate, blonde-haired, blue-eyed Jesus that Roman Catholicism pushes upon so many of you? Doesn't he look so pretty? Doesn't he look so beautiful, huh? Yeah, uh, Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Was not this white, blonde-haired, blue-eyed, effeminate-looking individual. No, he, he was a Jew. He was a Jew. He was a working man. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Look up at uh, Isaiah chapter 52, verses 13 and 14. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled, and be very high. As many as were stoned at thee, his visage, his face, was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. Remember, they pulled the beard out of our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. They yanked out his beard. They smote him on the head. They put a crown of thorns on his head. They beat him bludgeoned, bloody, gangrenous. He was crucified naked, scarred, cut up. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Verse 3 in Isaiah 53. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, a man of sorrows, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. So our Lord on the cross, sorrowful and acquainted with grief? You don't say. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. What happens when you go to a Jew with the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ? That God, the Father, was on the cross, died, buried, and rose again the third day according to the scriptures, shed his blood on the cross, to make an atonement for sin. What happens when you bring that to a Jew? What happens? Do you want me to believe that's our God? Who is naked, beaten, bloody? And you want me to believe that's our God? But he is. And we esteemed him not. Hmm. 
Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. And then when you go to Matthew chapter 27, Matthew chapter 27, verses 39 on to verse 43. And they passed, and they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads. What does it say here in Psalm 22? In verse 7, All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip, shoot out the lip, like just as it says, open their big mouth and blab something. All they that scorn me, see me, laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head, saying, go back to Matthew chapter 27. And uh, verse 39. And they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads. And saying, thou that destroyest the temple, and buildest it in three days, save thyself. The temple, of course, he was referring to his body. Okay? Remember, you and I are made in the image of God. We have a spirit. We have a soul. We have a body. Okay? God has a spirit, soul, and body. The Holy Ghost is the spirit. God the Father is the soul. The Word made flesh is the body. Okay? If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Verse 41. Likewise also the chief priests, mocking him with the scribes and elders, said, He saved others. Himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him, let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now, if he will have him. For he said, I am the Son of God. And also, too, looking in John chapter 1, John chapter 1, John chapter 1, verses 9 on to verse 14. John chapter 1, verses 9 on to verse 14. That was the true capital L light which lighteth, lighteth, lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Capital L, light, appears four times only here in the book of John. Only here in John chapter 1, okay? Uh, verses 7, 8, and 9. Four times, capital L, light, referring on to our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. Verse 10. He was in the world, and the world was made by him. And the world knew him not. And the world knew him not. Hmm. And when you look back in Isaiah chapter 53, cool, come on, follow me along. You are expected to. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 2. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Okay? And verse 3, he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Back to John chapter 1, verse 10. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. Okay? He came unto his own. Isn't that evident that our Lord sprang from the tribe of Judah? He came onto his own, the Jews, the Hebrews, okay? He came onto his own, and his own received him not. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. But as many as received him, those of his own, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on 
his name, which were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the Word, capital W, capital W Word, appears seven times in the authorized version of the Scriptures. Okay? And it's all, every single time you see a capital W Word in the Scriptures, it's every single time a reference unto our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? And the Word was made flesh. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory the glory as the only begotten of the father full of grace and truth the word was made flesh but he was a man acquainted with grief uh, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief hmm and he came unto his own and his own received him not Go back to Psalm 22. Okay, go back to Psalm 22. Pick your pardon, brethren. Psalm 22. Reading verses 6 and 8 again. On to verse 8 again. But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised of the people. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head, saying, He trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted, delighted in him. Verses 9 and 10. But thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breasts. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9, verses 2, on to verse 7. Isaiah chapter 9, verses 2, on to verse 7. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. Thou hast multiplied the nations, and not increase the joy. The joy before thee, they joy before thee according to the joy in harvest. And as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. Temporary. Temporary. Joy in harvest is like, oh, look at the bounty that we have had. Over time, though, that harvest will dwindle, won't it? And as men rejoice when they divide the spoil, divide the spoil, how long does that last? Hmm? For thou hast broken the yoke of his burden, and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, as in the day of Midian. For every battle of the warrior is with confused noise, and garments rolled in blood, but this shall be with burning and fuel of fire. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called. Capital W. Wonderful. Capital C. Counselor. The mighty God, the everlasting Father, <laughs> the Prince of Peace. So whoever this is talking about, he's a he's wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father. The Prince of Peace? Hmm. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David, and upon his kingdom to order it, the kingdom of heaven, 
and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Now, obviously, this is talking about who? Our Lord Jesus Christ. The everlasting Father. You mean not God the Son? Find God the Son for me in the authorized version of the scripture. Look real hard. Get your magnifying glass out. Go ahead. Find it for me. Let me let, me let you in on a little secret. The Trinity that's taught by Roman Catholicism that stems from Roman Catholicism. Uh, actually, the Trinity uh, comes from Babylon, Egypt, and is taught through Catholicism. <laughs> it's satanic. It's satanic blasphemy. One God and three divine persons. What is a person? A spirit, soul, and body? The Trinity is satanic, my dear friend. Whoever this is talking about, look, we know who it, who it is talking about, is wonderful. Counselor. Isn't that another counselor, a comforter, kind of like the Holy Ghost? And the Lord is that spirit. The mighty God, the everlasting Father. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now go to Isaiah chapter 42. Isaiah chapter 42. Isaiah chapter 42, verses 1 on to verse 9. Behold my servant whom I uphold, mine elect in whom my soul delighteth. My soul delighteth. God has a soul? Yeah, he does. Yeah. Spirit soul, and body. Hey, how does a voice walk, by the way, unless he has a body? Yeah, let's continue. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not cry, nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed shall he not break, and the smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. He shall not fail nor be discouraged till he have set judgment in the earth, and the isles shall wait for his law. Thus saith God the Lord, he that created the heavens and stretched them out, he that spread forth the earth, and that which cometh out of it. He that giveth breath unto the people. He that giveth breath unto the people upon it. And spirit to them that walk therein. I the Lord have called thee in righteousness. And will hold thine hand. I will keep thee. And give thee for a covenant of the people. For a light of the Gentiles. To open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the prison, and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images, you despicable Catholics. Behold, the former things are come to pass, and new things do I declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. Skip down a little to verses 18 on to verse 21. Check this out. In Isaiah 42, verses 18 on to verse 21. Hear ye, deaf, and look, ye blind, that ye may see. Who is blind but my servant, or deaf as my messenger that I sent? Who is blind as he that is perfect, and blind as the Lord's servant? Seen many things, but thou observest not. Opening the ears, but he heareth not. See, Jesus came preaching truth unto his people, the Jews. But they didn't have eyes to see, ears to hear. 
did they? No. The Lord is well pleased for his righteousness sake. Whose? The Lord Jesus Christ. He will magnify the law and make it honorable. Magnify the law. See, our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, he did what no man on earth could ever do. Keep the law perfectly. The law was perfect, just right, holy, and good. Beg your pardon. Paul uh, says that in the Pauline epistles. But it says he will magnify the law and make it honorable. Because only God could keep perfectly his own requirements. See, the Ten Commandments, those are the perfect requirements from a perfect God. But see, you and I, at our best, could never keep that. God. God. Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. God was manifest in the flesh. God, he could keep the law perfectly. He, what did he do? He magnified the law and he made it honorable because he, as a man, did what you and I could never do. He kept the law perfectly. He never sinned. See? He never sinned. Never sinned at all. Any wonder who this is talking about, by the way, again? Now go back to Psalm 22. Reading verses 9 and 10 again. But thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breasts. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. Be not far from me, for trouble is near. For there is none to help. Many bulls have compassed me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round. They gaped upon me with their mouth with their mouths, as a raving and a roaring lion. I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. It is believed that when our Lord was crucified, that his bones, not broken, Okay? Not one of his bones were broken. But in crucifixion, by the hands and through the feet, that sagging like that will eventually cause a bone or two to be dislocated. And also, too, um, maybe his limbs were dislocated in order to crucify him. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But verse 14 specifically, I am poured out like water. Jesus Christ on the cross, poured out like water. And all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It melted. It has melted in the midst of my bowels. On the cross, he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. They know not what they do. They didn't know that they were there mocking, wagging their head at their God, their Father, their promised Messiah, whom they delivered over to the Romans. Hmm. But rabbit trail here. It's going to be really interesting to see how you devils play out your little anti-Semitic tirade while trying to pretend that you're still of the church of the living God. It's going to be really interesting to see how you guys are going to try to pull that off. It started with one of you. Two more are coming, aren't, they, aren't you? Yeah. 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 I had to say that because our Lord said of the Jews, he who gave me over to you had the greater sin. But then again, you keep in mind the parable of the fig tree. He cursed that specific fig tree. Did all the fig trees die when our Lord cursed the fig tree? No. Just that one fig tree, right? Mm -hmm. 
That generation that handed the Lord over unto the Romans, that's what he was talking about. And let's be honest, while the Jews used the Roman system, yes, and in comparison to the parable of the fig tree that uh, dried up and brought forth no fruit, indicative to that very generation that our Lord Jesus Christ was talking about, okay? Um, did any of the Jews themselves stretch our Lord on the cross? Huh? Their genius? Did any of the Jews take the mallet and pound those nails into his hands and into his feet? Hmm. No. That was the Romans. Very subtle. Very subtle. Um, little thing that you've come up there with. Reflect upon thy word. Oh, that's not your name now, is it? <laughs> but come on, don't you coadjutors have uh, different tactics that you can use? Beg your pardon, brethren. Had to go on that little rabbit uh, trail there. Getting back to verse 14 here. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It has melted in the midst of my bowels. Could it be, could it be said that Jesus Christ, God our Father, was a little heartbroken on the cross? Verse 15. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws, and thou hast brought me into the dust of death. Go now to back to Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53. Now we will be reading verses 5 on to verse 9. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before the shears is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. This again plays into right here in verse 7, when you look in Psalm 22, verse 1, Our Lord only said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's all he said. He didn't quote the rest of it. Why? Verse 7 in Isaiah 53, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shears is dumb, not being able to speak, so he openeth not his mouth. Verse 5, but he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. He knew why he was there. He knew why he was there, okay? Let's continue on verse 8 in Isaiah 53. He was taken from prison and from judgment. Yeah, some kind of judgment they gave him uh, before the Sanhedrin, right? Or before the council, right? Yeah. <laughs> and who shall declare his generation? Who shall declare his generation? His, that generation that put him on the cross. That generation that turned him over to the Roman system to be crucified. Symbolic also of the fig tree. That specific fig tree. Not every single fig tree withered up. Don't forget that. Just that one alone. Okay? And who shall declare his generation? 
like I said, it's going to be really interesting to, to see how you devils play out that little thing that you seem to have started. Very, very interesting. All you Jesuit coadjutors, you're all anti-Semitic anyway. It's going to be really interesting how you play off being anti-Semitic by twisting the scriptures and still trying to convince people that you're actually saved. Good luck. I, 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 I wait to see how you guys play that out. All three of you. Started with just one. Other two are coming, aren't they? Yeah. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Which of you convinceth me of sin? Our Lord Jesus Christ said. Yeah, God can't sin. Okay, he never sinned at all. Okay. Now, go to First Peter. First Peter chapter 5. First Peter chapter 5. First Peter chapter 5. Come on, fingers work with me. I beg your pardon, brethren. <laughs> First Peter chapter 5. And we are going to be reading verses 8 and 9. But let's go back to Psalm 22. Psalm 22, verses 13 on to verse 15 again. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a roar, as a raving, and a roaring lion. Note the language there. As a raving and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue cleaveth to my jaws. And thou hast brought me into the dust of death. For his uh, persecutors, he was dumb, he didn't speak. But looking at verse 13, they gaped upon me with their mouths as a raving, ravening, and roaring lion. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resists steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. To be antichrist is number one, to be against, but number two, to replace, to counterfeit. Okay? Roman Catholicism is a counterfeit. Roman Catholicism is replacement theology. To be anti-Christ is one, to be against Jesus Christ, obviously. But number two, and more importantly, to replace with something else. And our Lord came first as a lamb to be sacrificed on the altar and to shed his blood for the remission of sins. But when he comes back, at the second coming with us, the church of the living God, okay, when he comes back down, he's going to be the lion of the tribe of Judah. You know, the Jewish flag, not the hexagram, the seal of Solomon, which is the seal of the Masons, okay? Yeah, the sign of the Masons. Okay, the mason, here's the woman, here's the man. You put the line in there, the G in the middle, which stands for generativity, which is a perverse sex symbol. That is not the flag of Israel. The true flag of Israel is the one that has the lion of the tribe of Judah on it. The lion of the tribe of Judah. And here in 1 Peter chapter 5, it says, be sober, uh, verses 8 and 9. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, as a roaring lion, 
walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Hmm. <laughs> as a roaring lion, counterfeit. But looking at verse 9, we, ha we have to address this. Uh, whom resists steadfast in the faith? <laughs> there are many out there, it's like when they come in contact with um, devils or whatnot, they do this scary thing where, I rebuke you! Yeah, you ain't rebuking nothing, boy! <laughs> You ain't rebuking nothing, boy. Them devils and uh, Paul, uh, uh, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are ye? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, James chapter 4, okay, we have to address this. Okay? See, in, in 1 Peter chapter 5, he says, Whom resists steadfast in the faith? Who are we resisting steadfast? The devil. How, how do you do that? James chapter 4, verses 7 on to verse 10. Okay? Now pay attention. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Now stop. Stop. Submit yourselves unto God. You know, bend that knee. Bend that knee. Submit yourselves therefore to God resist the devil and he will flee from you now and we just heard Peter say resist the devil you are not able to resist the devil without submitting yourself first to God that's why it's a horrific thing when and I've seen people do I've heard people do this too where they say, I this is indicative to a lot of these care Catholic, Pentecatholic people. Um, I rebuke you in the name. You ain't rebuking nothing, boy. You better watch it. You're rebuking. Remember, uh, Michael the Archangel wouldn't even dare to bring a railing accusation against Satan, but said, uh, what? The Lord rebuke thee? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. See, submit yourself. Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted, and mourn, and weep. Let your laughter, because you are joined in your sin, be turned to mourning, and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. We had to address that. We had to address that. Hope you don't mind. Had to address that. Now go back to Psalm 22. Had to address that. Verse 16. Because here, so far, the psalmist David is talking about how he has no strength. How he was cast upon him from the womb. How he felt forsaken. Kind of like what it must feel like for someone who is on the cross. See, crucifixion way back when. Crucifixion apparently still happens today in some countries, apparently. And see, when one is crucified through the hands, we'll touch on that a little later. But when someone is crucified, you are basically being suffocated by the weight of your own body and gravity pulling downward. Okay? It's a very gruesome death, apparently. Gruesome. Brutal death. It would be, you know, what was it? Uh... Back in Roman times, uh, back in these times, a merciful death would be someone to just slam some poison and they'd be dead pretty quick. While crucifixion was reserved for the worst of the worst because it was a horrible way to die. Thus far, what we've looked at in Psalm 22, thus far, doth that not look like a very good depiction of the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ? 
Hmm? Let's continue. Verse 16. For dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and feet. Hands. Hands and feet. Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. Okay? I'll explain in one second. Philippians chapter 3. We want verses, I just lost my place in my notes, verses 2 and 3. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Like these Jesuit coadjutor infiltrator pond scum. Beware of the concision. For we are the circumcision, those who are saved, saved, which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. This symbolizing the wafer cookie. And this is also symbolizing a certain individual, which I got that and I made a thumbnail out of it. And in the month of December, the video that will come, you'll see. You'll love it. I'm sure you will. Yeah. Okay. But we are admonished. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision. Beware of dogs. Okay. Beware of dogs. But now go to Zechariah chapter 13. You will hear, I've heard this before, and to my shame, there have been a few babes. I, I repented of it immediately, of course. But there have been a few times where I have encountered a couple of babes where they heard that Christ, when he was crucified, that his, the nails were in his wrists. Things that are different are not the same. A wrist is a wrist. A hand is a hand. Okay? If you have something through your hand, you cannot encompass that as meaning the wrist. Okay? And um, I've seen many have uh, talked about how, well, he must have been crucified through the wrist because his hands would have been torn off. Right? No. No. Okay? Zechariah chapter 13. That, that, is, that is a little thing that really irritates me. I've unfortunately gone off on a couple of babes before. I, like I said, I, I repented. It's like, I'm sorry, you didn't know better. Forgive me for being a jerk. But I, I've also encountered people who are saying, no, the, the, the scriptures are wrong because he was crucified through the wrists. You never read that in scripture. It's the hands. I have engraven thee upon the palms of my hands. They pierce my hands and my feet. This is, this is a little thing that really irritates me. Um, some of these Jesuit trained cemeterians, you know, the yea hath God, ye hath God said crowd who have come out, who have made arguments uh, like oh, Jesus have been pierced through the wrist. As I, am, as, I've, as, um, as I understand it, even Mr. Smiley, not the Jesuit coadjutor from Canada, but um, Mr. Smiley, David Daniels, even he believes that Jesus was crucified through the wrists, apparently. If I'm wrong on that, beg your pardon. But Zechariah chapter 13, verses 6 on to verse 9. And one shall say unto him, What are these wounds in thine hands? Then shall he answer, Those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. The house of my friends. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd. Oh. Oh, 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 hold your place here. Go back, go back to Isaiah chapter 53, okay? Awake, what, okay, hold on, let me get there. <laughs> hold on, let me get there, <laughs> okay? Look at that verse. Awake uh, in uh, Zechariah 
chapter 13, verse 7. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, and against the man that is my fellow, saith the Lord of hosts. Isaiah chapter 53. But he was wounded for our transgressions. Verse 5. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. The full wrath that you and I, as the church of the living God, ought to receive, our Lord took. Our Lord took that upon the cross, upon his flogging and whatnot. Now go back to uh, Zechariah chapter 13, verse 7. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, and against the man that is my fellow, saith the Lord of hosts. And this, of course, in the Garden of Gethsemane, came to pass. Smite the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered, and I will turn mine hand upon the little ones. And it shall come to pass that in all the land, saith the Lord, two parts therein shall be cut off and die. But the third shall be left therein, a remnant. And I will bring the third part through the fire and will refine them as silver is refined and will try them as gold is tried. They shall call on my name and I will hear them and, and I will hear them. I will say it is my people and they shall say the Lord is my God. Now this, especially verses 8 on to verse 9 is future prophecy yet to be fulfilled. Why? Because this is denoting for the time of Jacob's trouble when the Jew realizes, hey, those uh, authorized version of the scripture believers, okay? Those in the church of the living God were telling us the truth all along, okay? And note how it says, and I will bring the third part through the fire, the fire of the tribulation <laughs> of the time of Jacob's trouble, it will be the time of great tribulation, not the tribu uh, great tribulation. The great tribulation does not appear in Scripture. Find it. And, po and put the authorized version of the Scripture verse in the comment section. Good luck, okay? Good luck. This is future prophecy when Jerusalem, Israel, will receive their king. When they, midway during the time of Jacob's trouble, they figure it out. And they're like, oh, wow, they were telling us the truth. Jesus Christ is our king. Verses 8 and 9 are future prophecy yet to be fulfilled. And that will be fulfilled during the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay? Future prophecy. Because uh, verse 7, verse 6 and 7 already happened, didn't it? But verses 8 and 9 have yet to happen. Go back now to Psalm 22, verses 17 and 18. I may tell all my bones, they look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. Now, obviously, we know they already did that when the Roman soldiers cast lots for our Lord's garment, okay? But... Go back now to Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 12, Zechariah chapter 12, Zechariah chapter 12, verses 10 on to verse 14. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as, when, as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. Now, about verse 10. Yes, there were some that were mourning over the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. But Jerusalem, Israel, in a whole, were they mourning for him 
as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn, as a nation, as a collection of people? No. No. They weren't. They weren't. And look upon me whom they have pierced? They looked upon him on the cross, yes. But see, at his second coming, where every eye is going to see him, at his second coming, they're going to look on he on him whom they pierced. Okay? Keep reading. In that day, the day of the crucifixion? No. In that day shall there be a great morning in Jerusalem, as in the morning of Hadad Rimon, in the valley of Megiddon. And the land shall mourn every family apart, the family of the house of David apart, and their wives apart, and the family of the house of Nathan apart, and their wives apart, the family of the house of Levi apart, and their wives apart, the family of Shimei apart, and their wives apart, all the families that remain. Every family apart and their wives apart. This now, okay, verse 10. They're going to look on him whom they have pierced when he come down at his second coming. They're going to weep. It's like, oh, wow, we should have, we should have woken up to this sooner. We should have known. We, they knew the truth was given to them. But it's going to take the time of Jacob's trouble midway through for the Jews to realize, well, we missed it. They were telling us the truth. They, the church of the living God, which gets caught up before the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay? And then, once they figure it out, from verses 11 on to verse 14, they're going to think, oh, wow, we really messed it up. We should have believed on him when he was first here. Future prophecy. But, but now let's read verses 6 on to verse 9 in Zechariah chapter 12, okay? Verses 6 on to verse 9. Check this out. In that day will I make the governors of Judah like an hearth of fire among the wood. In that day. Did that already happen? No. This is future prophecy. Okay? Let's continue. And like a torch of fire in, the, in a sheath. And they shall devour all the people round about. On the right hand on, and on the left. And Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place. Even in Jerusalem. The Lord also shall save the tents of Judah first, because our Lord sprang from Judah, that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem do not magnify themselves against Judah. Has this happened over? Has this happened yet? In that day shall the Lord defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and he that is feeble among them at that day shall be as David, and the house of David shall be as God, as the angel of the Lord be for them. Talking about when our Lord Jesus Christ comes back at his second coming. This is future prophecy yet to be fulfilled. Okay? Talking about his second coming. Okay? This has not already happened yet. Hmm. Okay, verse 9. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. You know, like the 200 million man army that Satan's going to raise up to bring everybody uh, against Jerusalem. This is future prophecy. Talking about the second coming that deals with the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay. 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 Now go to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. John chapter 6. John chapter 6. We want verses 37 on to verse 40. John chapter 6. 37 on to verse 40. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which has sent me, 
that of all which hath, uh, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life. And I will raise him up at the last day. Now, this is before the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, when he said this in John chapter 6. Before the death, burial, and resurrection was what? Doctrinally, the Old Testament, because the law was still binding. The perfect sacrifice for sin had not yet been made. Doctrinally, before the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Before the crucifixion. This is still doctrinally the Old Testament. It's in the collection of books, yes, of the New Testament. But before the death, burial, and resurrection, this is Old Testament, buddy. Okay? And no. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son. Um, newsflash. Today in this dispensation, we walk by faith, not by sight, right? Come on, come on. Even you easy believers and devil heretics know that one. Yeah, come on. For we walk by faith, not by sight, right? And the Jews require a sign? So see, when he is saying this, he is saying it as the king, which was on the earth, offering the kingdom of heaven unto the Jewish people. So when he says, and this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son, you and I today in this dispense, you're not going to see the, the Son. You're not going to see our Lord Jesus Christ. And if there are a lot of people out there who said that they have seen Jesus, you lie and your breath stink. You lie. You lie. Paul went up to where God is, the third heaven, Okay? And he didn't, he didn't say, he said, he saw things that it was not lawful for a man to utter. The Apostle Paul. Then you got that kid Burpo coming to, uh, saying he went to heaven and saw Jesus. You see a lot of these uh, Caracatholic, Pentecatholic nitwits saying they've seen Jesus. If Paul the Apostle who did see Jesus, by the way, on the road to Damascus? Saw him with his eyes, you know, so bright that it blinded him temporarily. And when he went up to the third heaven, you know, where God is, okay? Yes, Paul saw our Lord Jesus Christ. Was he blah, 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 blah about what he saw? It, <laughs> Please, um, if you if you claim to have seen the Lord Jesus Christ, you're lying. You're lying. Paul saw the Lord Jesus Christ, and he never uttered it. He never said anything about it, other than the fact that yeah, I saw him. Yeah left it alone, okay? He didn't build upon it because it wasn't lawful for our man to utter. Then you got these twits. I've been to heaven. I've seen... Sh shut up. Lying devils, okay? Lying devils. That's what they is. Back to Psalm 22, verses 17 and 18 again. I may tell all my bones, they look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. Now see, verses 17 and 18 is specifically referring on to when they looked at him at the crucifixion, okay? Again, because Psalm 22 is referring to, uh, can be likened onto our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross, okay? And verse 14 is imperative. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It has melted in the midst of the, my bowels. Hmm. Okay? 
Now let's continue reading. But be not thou far from me, O Lord, my strength. Haste thee to help me. Deliver my soul from the sword, my darling from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth. And the devil walking around as a roaring lion. Save me from the lion's mouth. For thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorns. Now, verse 22 is where this psalm shifts. Okay? Because up to verse 22, you are reading about someone who is humiliated, who is depressed, who is isolated, who is, feels forsaken. Very similar to God manifest in the flesh who is on the cross. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But in verse 22, this is where the psalm shifts. Okay, Virtually in almost every single psalm, almost every single psalm, there is a point within a psalm where it shifts. Okay, you, you'll be able to notice this if you spend any time in the Psalms. Okay, but usually there is a point in every Psalm, in almost every Psalm, where it will shift dramatically. Here it is, the shifting point in this Psalm. I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. And there is only one name given among men under heaven by where we must be saved. There is only one name uh, given unto men under heaven where, by where which we must be saved. I'm butchering that. I'm bradizing that. But there's only one name given among men whereby we must be saved. Not three. <laughs> three divine persons. A person is a spirit's own body. Three persons that make one God. Bloop, satanic blasphemy. No. There's only one name. I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. Ye that fear the Lord, praise him. All ye the seed of Jacob, glorify him and fear him. All ye the seed of Israel. See, up to verse 22, it's talking about, uh, is likened unto the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 22, unto the close of this psalm, is likened unto the millennial kingdom, as some call it, the kingdom of heaven. Let's keep reading. Ye that fear the Lord, praise him. All ye the seed of Jacob, glorify him, and fear him, all ye the seed of Israel. Does all the seed of Israel fear the Lord today? Hardly. For he hath not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. And there are, the Jews are going to be afflicted during the time of Jacob's trouble. Jacob is Israel. The time of Israel's trouble. Okay? It's not for the purification of the church. Okay? That's Catholic satanic blasphemy. Okay? Neither hath he hid his face from him, but when he cried unto him, he heard. My praise shall be of thee in the great congregation. I will pay my vows before them that fear him. Verse 26. The meek shall eat and be satisfied. They shall praise the Lord that seek him. Your heart shall live forever. Now, Matthew chapter 5. See... Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon on the Mount, is what? It is not doctrine for us today in this dispensation, the time of the Gentiles. No, it is not. Faith is mentioned one time during the Sermon on the Mount. Just one time. And it's in the form of a rebuke. There's no mention of the death, burial, and resurrection. There's no mention of the cross. There's no mention of the blood that maketh atonement for sins. Is there? No. It's all works. It's all works uh, in the sermon on the uh, in the sermon on the mount. That's why Catholics like it. Catholics is work salvation without assurance of salvation. 
okay? But it's all works. This Sermon on the Mount is what it's going to be like in the kingdom of heaven, okay? That's what it's going to be like. That's what this is about, the Sermon on the Mount. It's about the kingdom of heaven. It's not doctrine for us today. So, with that, Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 under verse 12. But let's refresh our memory in verse 26 in Psalm 22. The meek shall eat and be satisfied. They shall praise the Lord that seek him. Your heart shall live forever. Like I told you, beginning at verse 22 on to verse 31 is all about the kingdom of heaven in this psalm. Uh, up to uh, 20 of uh, verse 1 under verse 21 is likened unto the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verses 22 under verse 31 in Psalm 22, kingdom of heaven. Let's read. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Verse 26, the meek shall eat and be satisfied. They shall praise the Lord that seek him. Your heart shall live forever. Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 under 12. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Kingdom of heaven, every time it appears, and it appears in the book of Matthew, is talking about the actual physical, literal kingdom of heaven in Jerusalem, where our Lord Jesus Christ is going to sit on the throne, rule and reign from there, and rule the world, all nations, with a rod of iron. We'll look at that in a little bit, just so you know, okay? But let's continue. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Yeah, you have to have a really pure heart uh, leading up to the kingdom of heaven, because what precede what comes before the kingdom of heaven the time of Jacob's trouble yeah yeah you take that mark of the beast you're going to hell no ifs ands or buts about it yeah yeah blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called the son the children of God blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake for theirs is the kingdom of heaven Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Now, instruction and in righteousness for us today? Absolutely. Doctrinally, people. Doctrine. Sermon on the Mount, on the Mount does not apply for us today. It applies for the kingdom of heaven because the Sermon on the Mount is about the kingdom of heaven. To instruct us in righteousness for today? Absolutely. Doctrinally? Yeah. Okay? Please don't get confused over that. If you are, you're not rightly dividing the word of truth, sir. Okay? Just letting you know. Okay? Somebody got to tell you that. Okay? Now go back to Psalm 22. I almost said chapter. <laughs> Psalm 22. Verses 27 on verse 29 now. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn on to the Lord. <laughs> Has that happened today? Oh, that son of perdition, when we, the church of the living God, get caught up, he's going to uh, counterfeit that in a way. But has that happened at all today? Even through the heretical, satanic, ecumenical movement? Yeah. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord, and all the kindreds of the nations shall worship before thee. See, kingdom of heaven. This is talking about the kingdom of heaven, when all nations are going to be subservient unto our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, who will be reigning as king from Jerusalem, okay? Verse 28. For the kingdom is the Lord's, the kingdom of heaven. And he is the governor among the nations. Oh, what did we read in Isaiah chapter 9? That the government shall be upon his shoulders? Uh-huh, uh-huh. 
and verse 29. All they that be fat upon earth shall eat and worship. All they that go down to the dust shall bow before him. And none can keep alive his own soul. Back to Zechariah. Back to Zechariah chapter 14. Back to Zechariah, not Micah. <laughs> what scam stuff did you devils just send me now? Zechariah chapter 14, verses 16 on to verse 17. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem. Now hold on. And it shall come to pass that every one that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem. Look at verse 27 in Psalm 22. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord. And all the kindreds of the nations shall worship before thee. Verse 16 in Zechariah chapter 14. And it shall come to pass that every one that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast, feast of tabernacles. All the nations that are left. Remember, Satan is going to call together a 200 million man army among many nations. And our Lord Jesus Christ, what is he going to do? He's just going to speak and psst, they're all gone. Just like that. So the nations that are left, the nations that survive the time of Jacob's trouble, people. Okay? Not this time. You, you, you have to rightly divide the word of truth, friend, or you're going to be in so much doctrinal error, it's not even funny. Okay? You, you have to rightly divide the word of truth. Okay? All right? This is talking about, this is future fulfillment. This is the, for the kingdom of heaven. Okay? Kingdom of heaven. Not the time of Jacob's trouble this is talking about. Because those who survive the time of Jacob's trouble, everyone that survives of the nations are all going to have to go to the Lord Jesus Christ, like it says here, to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. They got to do that every year. If they don't do that, and it shall be, verse 17, that who, whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the king, our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. And that's going to be important because during the kingdom of heaven, okay, it's going to be farming. Okay, genetically modified poison is not going to be available. Praise the Lord. Okay? Fast food. Factory, factory engineered plastic meats. All this nonsense. It's not going to be there. It's going to be farming. Agriculture. Uh, uh, what is it called? An agrarian society. That's what it's going to be like during the kingdom of heaven. Okay? None of this technology. No genetically. Praise the Lord. No genetically modified in, uh uh, organisms, nothing like that. So those who survive the time of Jacob's trouble and every year don't go up to worship Jesus Christ at the Feast of Tabernacles, they ain't going to get no rain. And if they ain't get no rain, they ain't going to have no crops. And if they ain't got no crops, they ain't going to have no food. See? See? Like I told you. Psalm 22 from verses 22, no coincidence, on to verse 31, it's talking about the kingdom of heaven. Okay, so let's continue now. Okay, now go to Psalm 2. You're going to love this. You're going to love this. Go to Psalm 2. You're going to love this. Psalm 2. Okay, with what we just read in Zechariah. Okay, you've noticed that we've gone to Zechariah quite a few times today. Psalm 2. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? 
The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. <laughs> yeah, the 200 million man army. See, Satan's all about flesh. You Catholics, you wicked Catholics, you're all about flesh. So Satan, when he gets his 200 million man army against God, the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, <laughs> our Lord, <laughs> what is it? All, and all our Lord's got to say is like, <laughs> go. And just like that, all he has to do is speak. <laughs> 200 million men. <laughs> Go. Yeah. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. You figure that one out, huh? Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Zion, Jerusalem. Where our King, our Lord Jesus Christ, is going to be ruling and reigning from. I will declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the upper uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. He's, when he comes back, he's going to rule the entire world. Okay? Thou shalt break them with a pot of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings. Because if you're not wise during the kingdom of heaven and go and worship the king, our Lord Jesus Christ, you're not going to have any food. Okay? Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings, be instructed, ye judges of the earth, rulers. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Kiss the son lest he be angry. Fulfillment, as in we just read in Zechariah chapter 14. The kings of the earth, they're in the kingdom of heaven. If they don't go up to worship the Lord and to praise him and give thanks on him uh, at the Feast of Tabernacles, they're not going to have any food. He's going to starve them out. Okay? Now, go to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. The Lord a while ago um, gave to your servant a expository video on Revelation chapter 12. If I can remember, I'll try to put it in the description box. Okay? I can't often remember. So, <laughs> Revelation chapter 12, verses 1 under verse 5. And I, a while ago, um, was in error on this, thinking that parts of this had already happened in Revelation chapter 12. But it has not. This is all future. Okay? And that's what that one uh, expository video is about, addressing that error I made. Okay? But, Revelation chapter 12. Yeah, I make mistakes. And when I make mistakes, I, uh, I admit them publicly and repent of them publicly. And I leave my mistakes up for you can see them. You know, keeping me accountable, that kind of a thing, okay? Revelation chapter 12, verses 1 under verse 5. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. Twelve stars the twelve tribes of Israel, the woman, Israel. And she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. 
And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, Satan, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Remember how Herod, uh, after he learned of the birth of Jesus, that he sent the guys out there after the wise men kind of like pfft, mocked them and whatnot. And he had them kill everyone from what, two years old and under or something like that. Okay. Verse five. And she, Israel, okay, Israel, and she, Israel, brought forth a man child, the Lord Jesus Christ, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. Clearly. Okay. If I, I think I'll remember. If I remember, I'll put the Revelation chapter 12 expository video in the description box where we go through that very, very good video. And all praise to the Lord Jesus Christ. But see, the woman is Israel, the 12 stars, uh, the 12 stars and a crown, the 12 tribes of Israel. Okay, and the man-child that Israel, the woman brought forth, our Lord Jesus Christ, who sprang from the tribe of Judah. Okay, okay, and while we are here, Revelation chapter 19, the second coming. Verses 11 under verse 15. Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 under verse 15. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. Where you see the son of perdition, uh, earlier in the book of Revelation, he goes forth conquering to conquer, he has a bow with no arrows, and he has on his head a single crown. That's that son of perdition, that man of sin, the son of perdition. Inaccurately referred to as the Antichrist, okay? Let me see. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word, capital W, of God. And if I'm not mistaken, that is the seventh and final appearance of the capital W Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. That's us, the church of the living God. We get caught up with him, we come in back with him, okay? That's us, the church of the living God, who get redeemed before the time of Jacob's trouble, okay? And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of almighty God. Let's read verse 16. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords, our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. Now go back to Psalm 22. Let's, let's finish this up, shall we? Verses 30 on to verse 31. A seed shall serve him. It shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. They shall come and shall declare his righteousness unto a people that shall be born that he hath done this. Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11, verses 1 under verse 4. I say then, hath God cast away his people? 
like Catholics like to teach you, like these coadjutor devil Jesuits uh, are adhering to their replacement theology. They hate the Jews, okay? Oh, but you hate Catholicism, right? Yeah. <laughs> Incidentally, if you make it this far, I've already put your new thing. And you, I'm not going to receive your emails. So go away. Okay. I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. What ye not what the scripture saith of Elias, Elijah, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. And of course, you can check the reference on that in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 18. Okay? A remnant. There is a remnant. Okay? A seed. What does that say in um, uh, verse 30? A seed shall serve him. It shall be count, accounted to the Lord for generation. A seed. A little seed. Okay? Now go to Isaiah chapter 53 again. You've noticed now that we have gone through the entire chapter of Isaiah 53. I hope you've noticed that. Of course, you've noticed that if you're following along. Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53, verses 10 under verse 12. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He had put him to grief. He hath put him to grief. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. The seed shall serve him. These are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Future uh, prophecy. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, already happened, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he has poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. So he gave him a name among the great, and there's only one name given among men whereby we must be saved. Now go to Isaiah chapter 65. Isaiah chapter 65. Check this out. You're going to love this. Isaiah chapter 65, verses 1 on to verse 10. Check this out. I am sought of them that ask not for me. I am found of them that sought me not. I said, Behold me, behold me unto a nation that was not called by my name. I have spread out my hands, okay, comparison, verse 2. I have spread out my hands all the day unto a rebellious people, which walketh in a way that was not good, after their own thoughts. But yet, hath God cast away his people? God forbid! No, no, no. They are enemies of the gospel for our sake. And we have been grafted into their tree to bring them into, onto jealousy. You think the Jews are jealous of what they see, what is called Christian today? <clears throat> I have spread out my hands all the day unto a rebellious people, which walketh in a way that is not, that was not good, after their own thoughts. A people that provoketh me to anger continually to my face, that sacrificeth in gardens, and burneth incense upon altars of brick. 
which remain among the graves, dead. Enlarge in the monuments, which eat swine's flesh, and broth of abominable things is in their vessels, which say, Stand by thyself, come not near to me, for I am holier than thou. These are a smoke in my nose, a fire that burneth all the day. A smoke in God's nose, a fire that burneth all the day. You can also tie, uh, um, tie this in to the Holocaust of the Jew. Okay? Behold, it is written before me. I will not keep silence, but I will recompense with an ass. Even recompense into their bosom. Recompense with an S. Verb. Recompense with a C. Noun. Your iniquities and the iniquities of your fathers together, saith the Lord. Wait. Your iniquities and the iniquities of your fathers together, saith the Lord, which have burned incense upon the mountains and blasphemed me upon the hills. Therefore will I measure their former work into their bosom. Time of Jacob's trouble in comparison to the Holocaust of the Jew during World War II, the Holocaust of the Jew of World War II is going to look like nothing in comparison to the time of Jacob's trouble, the Holocaust that is coming soon enough. It's going to dwindle in comparison. Thus saith the Lord, as the new wine is found in the cluster, and one saith, Destroy it not, for a blessing is in it. So will I do for my servant's sake, that I may not destroy them all. A seed shall serve me. Okay. And note the new wine is found in the cluster. And our Lord says, I am the vine. Abide in me, because you cannot do anything unless you abide in me. And if you read Romans chapter 11, how it talks about being grafted into an olive tree. Okay. And I will bring forth a seed out of Jacob. And out of Judah, an inheritor of my mountains. And mine elect shall inherit it. And my servants shall dwell there. This is not talking about Calvinism, okay? This is future prophecy to be fulfilled, okay? His elect, okay? He chose to wear the cross, okay? Our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, the Anointed One, okay? This is future prophecy. I will bring forth the seed out of Jacob, and out of Judah, an inheritor of my mountains, our Lord Jesus Christ. And mine elect shall inherit it. And my servant shall dwell there. And Sharon shall be a fold of flocks. And the valley of Achor, a place for the, the herds to lie down in. For my people that have sought me. For my people that have sought me. Paul says, and all Israel shall be saved. But we know that not all Israel is going to, during the time of Jacob's trouble, turn unto the Lord. But that remnant, those that are left, those that are surviving during that horrific time, okay, that is all of Israel that will be saved, okay? For my people that have sought me. See, midway during the uh, time of Jacob's trouble, that man of sin, the son of perdition, is going to go into the third rebuilt temple, Looking, I believe, like the Catholic Jesus, saying, I am your God. And then the Jews, uh, some of them, you know, there are going to be Jews, obviously, that take the mark of the beast in their right hand or in their forehead. They're gone. But those that don't, those that seek him, they're going to be like, uh-oh, wait a minute. That, that no. Then they're going to realize that the authorized version of the scripture is God's word, and that we, the church of the living God, that gets caught up before that time, we're telling them the truth. Then they're going to get it. And I believe it's midway through. When they see the abomination that make it desolate, he who readeth, let him understand. Okay? 
But ye are they that forsake the Lord, that forget my holy mountain, that prepare a table for that troop, and that furnish the drink offering unto that number. Therefore will I number you to the sword, and ye shall all bow down to the slaughter. Because when I called, ye did not answer. When I spake, ye did not hear, but did evil before mine eyes, and did choose that wherein I delighted not. And choose that which I delighted not. Now, go to First uh, First Timothy. Go to First Timothy. Why did Why did the Lord say that then? Okay, we've we've been through. We just were through Psalm twenty-two. First part of it is uh, likened unto our Lord on the cross. Second part of it likened unto the kingdom of heaven. Okay. The lamb and the lion. Get it? 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. God was manifest in the flesh. Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Okay? Jesus is God the Father. It, he even calls himself the Father. Okay? In John chapter 14. Look it up. Uh, Isaiah chapter 9 refers to him as the everlasting Father. One God. Spirit, soul, and body. Not three divine persons. A person is a spirit, soul, and body. Okay? Okay? Three divine persons to make one God? No. No. But it was the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Okay? Okay? Now, go to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Come on. We, Brother, we had to go through. We couldn't. We couldn't not go through Psalm 22, okay? We couldn't do that. <laughs> but Psalm, uh, Philippians chapter 2, Philippians chapter 2, verses 5, unto verse 11. Let this mind be in you, which, also, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, <laughs> you look up verse 6 in one of the Bibles, you know, like an NIV, ESV, I think even the non-King James. You look that verse up in a Bible. Wow, do they do a real number on that verse. Check it out. You'll be astonished. Verse 7. But made of himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Okay? Made, he took the form of the servant, a man, made in the likeness of men, man. Man from his birth is not good. Flesh, all flesh is sinful. Okay? You wicked devil Catholic, all flesh is sinful, okay? Sin has been condemned to the flesh, okay? So, God was manifest in the flesh. God was manifest in the likeness of men. I have to, have to. Go to Romans chapter 8, verses 3. On to verse 4. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. The flesh profiteth nothing. The, the Spirit truly is willing, 
but the flesh is weak. Okay? God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. Okay? Go back to Philippians. But made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Okay? So God was manifest in the flesh Made in the likeness of man. Men. Man is sinful. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. Hold your place here. Go to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4, I believe it's verse 12. Acts chapter 4. Thank you, Lord, for some sunshine. Yes. Acts chapter 4. I believe it's verse 12. Yes. This is what I was trying to quote earlier. Beg your pardon. Should have came here. Beg your pardon. Uh, let's read verses 11 and 12. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is, there, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. There's only one name. Go back to Philippians verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 10. On to, where did I tell you we were reading? Uh, verse 11. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things on earth and things under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There's only one name given among men whereby we must be saved. Only one. Okay? So... God was manifest in the flesh, and he took on him the form of a man, okay? He was, the word was made flesh. Flesh is sinful. You idiot, okay? Flesh is sinful. Even the flesh of our Lord Jesus Christ was sinful, yes, okay? But, but, okay? Now go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. And we already read in uh, Isaiah chapter 53, okay? He never sinned, but God will provide himself a lamb for burnt offering. Because it is the blood of not the flesh that makes an atonement for the soul. Okay? For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. This is another verse to look up in a Bible to see how they butcher it. This is talking about imputed righteousness onto the saved sinner, which these lost devils have no idea about. Imputed righteousness. See, they go about to uh, establish their own righteousness because they just believe. Or you're a wicked, sinful, or a, yeah, sinful, sinless perfection nitwit. Okay? Imputed righteousness. Imputed righteousness. By what he had done. Now go to 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. Okay? 1 John chapter 3. Verse, just one verse. Just one verse. And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins. Verse 5. And in him is no sin. You know when Paul says that in me, that is, in my flesh dwelleth no good thing? 
See, you and I are made in the image of God. We have a spirit, we have a soul, we have a body, okay? The Word made flesh. The flesh was sinful. The Word, our Lord Jesus Christ, was not sinful, obviously, because God cannot sin, okay? It's the flesh, you idiot, okay? The flesh, okay? Okay, but getting a little sidetracked. God was manifest in the flesh. He lived as a man. He went through everything that you and I went to, uh, go through. He experienced hunger. As far as we know, he might have had pimples when he was growing up. Uh, he might have had bad breath, body over, odor. Uh, guess what? God going to the bathroom? Also, as we read in Psalm 22, see, as a man, he had the feelings of man. And as a man, having the feelings of man, don't you think he was a little hurt by that? Go to Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3, verses 1 on to verse 6. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who hath builded the house hath more honor than the house. Let's stop right there. Who built the house? Hmm? God? Is not your body the temple of the Holy Ghost? Who built the house? God? The Word was made flesh. Okay? Look at that, look at that verse. For this, man has, for this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, insomuch as he who hath builded the house hath more honor than the house. For every house is builded by some man, but he that built all things is God. And Moses verily was faithful in all his house, as a servant, for a testimony of those things which were spoken, which were to be spoken after. But Christ, as a son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end? Whose house are we? Today, in this dispensation, you got to remember, the book of Hebrews is written for the Jews during the time of Jacob's trouble, when they realize that they've missed it. And that we, the Church of the Living God, through the authorized version of the Scriptures, we're telling them the truth all along. That's why the book of Hebrews is set up in the way it is, explaining it on to the Jewish people like that, okay? But today, in this dispensation, you are saved, born again, converted, a new creature in Christ Jesus. God dwells within you. If you come to Him broken, contrite, and in fear of the Lord, call upon the name of the Lord and that He save you, okay? But you have God living within you, our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. You know, the Holy Ghost, the Lord is that Spirit. Okay, yeah. You have the God in you. Hence, we are his bones and his flesh. Remember, he cannot deny himself. Why? Because we are his bones and his flesh. We are part of his body. Okay, we are not little Christs. Dealt with this in the previous video. But we are part of his bones and his flesh. Okay? Okay? The difference is this is a different dispensation. Hebrews and James is written for the Jews during the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay, That's why when you read in the book of Hebrews about how someone can lose their salvation and not get it back. Okay? Okay? So, but now while in Hebrews, let's look at ver uh, chapter 4 verses 14 on to verse 16. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, 
Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our profession. Our profession. Look at this. Don't look at me. Look at the verse. Verse 15. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our in feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Look at verse 15 again. Look at verse 15, okay? For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. I know what some of you might be thinking about how it says in James chapter 1. God cannot be tempted with evil, right? Go there. James chapter 1. James 1 verses 13 on to verse 15. Let no man say when God is when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Okay, so looking at verse 13, let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. And it says here in verse 15 in Hebrews chapter 4, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. God was manifest in the flesh. Okay. He was made in fashion as a man and all flesh is sinful. God can't be tempted to do evil, no. But put God in a skin suit. You know, the Word made flesh and subject Him to everything that you and I are subject onto. God can't be tempted to do evil. Jesus never sinned, okay? Uh, uh, where, 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 where were we going here? 1 Peter chapter 2, okay? 1 Peter chapter 2. Let's remember this. 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 21 on to verse 24. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Who did no sin, okay? Neither was guile found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. And we've been through Isaiah chapter 53 today. Okay? So, Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. The Word made flesh. But God can't be tempted with evil. But yet, note this. This, this is key to understanding this. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling, feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. That flesh, the Word made flesh, God in flesh, okay? That flesh, that is what was tempted. Satan's temptation in the wilderness was all what? To the flesh. Because God can't be tempted to do evil. But God in flesh, the skin suit can be tempted 
Absolutely. Absolutely. And note the feeling of our infirmities. Think about it. The flesh of Jesus Christ. The flesh profiteth nothing. Catholic, get over it. Okay? The flesh profiteth nothing. Okay? The flesh of Jesus Christ, as far as we know, the temptation, being around all those women, okay? To make food uh, from bread, uh, make bread from rocks, from stones, okay? To cast himself down, okay? He, he felt righteous anger, okay? He had a cause to be angry, by the way, okay? Through the flesh, maybe have been tempted, I don't know, for women, I don't know, but God himself, the Word, made flesh. The Word, God, our Father, was not tempted. The flesh was. And God in that flesh says right there, which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Okay? Go to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26, verses 36 on to verse 46. Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, thank you, brother, and began to be very and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then saith he unto them, My soul, God the Father, the soul of the Godhead, is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here, and watch with me. And he went a little further, and fell on his face, and prayed, saying, O my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Jesus is the Father. So was he praying to himself? Have you never talked to yourself? Okay. How can the Father be on earth in the Godhead and be in heaven? Great is the mystery of godliness. Okay. All right. Okay. We're going to touch on that. Uh, how God could be, you know, in heaven, but yet on earth in Christ Jesus, the Father. Okay. Jesus is the Father. We're going to touch on that. But when he's praying here, Jesus is the Father. My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. Verse 39. He went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, Oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Now, Christ on the cross, you know, Christ going to the cross, he felt every whip, lash, punch, slap, kick, spit, crown, nail. He felt it all. What was troubling him? What did Satan tempt in the wilderness? And he cometh unto his disciples, and findeth them asleep, and saith unto Peter, What? Could ye not watch with me one hour? Catholic. Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You getting it? He went away again the second time and prayed, saying, O my Father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. 
And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then cometh he to his disciples and saith unto them, <laughs> Sleep on now. And take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand. The Son of Man is betrayed, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. Behold, he that is, he is at hand that doth betray me. And it's talking about Judas Iscariot. Uh, look at verse 50. And Jesus said unto him, Friend, have I not chose you twelve, and one of you is a devil? Friend, where art thou? Wherefore art thou come? And also, while we're here, Peter, you know, in the garden, takes a sword out, and goes and laughs off Malchus's ear. And look at what Jesus says from verses fifty-two on to verse fifty-six. Then said Jesus unto him, Put up again thy sword into his place. For all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels? But how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled that thus it must be? In that same hour, Jesus said Jesus to the multitudes, Are ye come out as against a thief with swords and staves for to take me? I sat daily with you teaching in the temple, and ye laid no hold on me. But all this was done, that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled, smite the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Verse 54, but how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled that thus it must be? He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Matthew chapter 27, where we began, verse, verse 46. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's he's the Godhead, spirit, soul, and body. The Holy Ghost, the Father, the Word made flesh. Okay? Why did he say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. God was manifest in the flesh. He went through everything that you and I went through. He experienced every temptation through flesh. Because God, remember, cannot be tempted with evil. But God in flesh, this flesh can be tempted. Oh, yeah. And remember, Satan, um, what, is it? what is that? Matthew chapter 16, right? Matthew chapter 16. Uh, yeah, Matthew chapter 16, verse 23. Remember this, okay? When you deal with these disgusting Catholics. But he turned and said unto Peter. Uh, Matthew 16 verse 23. Get thee behind me Satan. Thou art an offense unto me. For thou savorest not the things that be of God. But those that be of men. Flesh boy. That's what Satan is all about. Flesh. So God manifest in flesh. On the cross, who went through everything that you and I have gone through, who's experienced every temptation like you and I have. But God can't be tempted. Have you been reading with me? Okay? It's, it's this that was tempted. It was this, the flesh, in the Garden of Gethsemane. It was this, the flesh. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's why. 
because God as man on the cross went through, and we looked at it in Psalm 22, God as man on the cross went through what any other man on a cross would go through. That's why Psalm 22 is so imperative and so beautiful to understanding the cross. Okay? That's why. And that's why, again, our Lord only, only in Psalm 22, he only said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He didn't quote the rest of it because he knew why he was there. God as man, God manifest in the flesh, Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. On the cross, God as man went through everything that you and I have gone through. Every temptation. Every, everything. Okay? God doesn't know how I feel. Yes, he does. Because he's been through it. You might be saying, well, there's different things that we go through today that they didn't go through. In some sense, you're right, but what's the basis of it? What's the basis of your problem? Death, sorrow, and sin. That's it. Okay? Death, sorrow, and sin. Shock it up to one of those three, buddy. Death, sorrow, and sin. That's it. He was a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. He died, buried, and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And because of our sin, because of our sin, he died on the cross. Because of what you did. It's your fault. Yeah, it's my fault too. I already know that. Go to Psalm 139. Psalm 139. See, you wicked Trinitarians, you got to understand, okay, what you believe is from Satan. It had its origins in Babylon. Okay, in Babylon, you can read about that. It had its origins in Babylon, in Egypt, and it has been, <laughs> you could say, I guess, perfected this evil heresy of Trinitarianism, one God of three, person, uh, and three persons, whoop, has been perfected, you could say, by Satan's church, Roman Catholicism. Catholicism has every single thing wrong with it. But yet they have who God is right. <laughs> I guess one out of a million, huh? Yeah, Catholicism is wrong on everything else. But who God is? One God and boop, three persons? They got that right? Oh, I guess they must be Christians then, huh? You're right, they are Christians. Yeah. Yeah, yeah they are. I'm not. <laughs> Thank you. Okay? Psalm 139. You know, we as finite man can't grasp, even though it's told us, even though we believe this, we can't grasp just how big God is. See, Satan is a created being. He's not as big as God. <laughs> Hardly. What is it he, uh, the, the Lord measures the world by the span of his hand, okay? We are as grasshoppers in his sight. Hmm? Psalm 139, verses 1 under verse 12, then we'll be done. O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my down-sitting and my uprising. Thou understandest 
my thought afar off. God knows your thoughts. Satan doesn't know your thoughts. Thou compassest my path and my lying down and art acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Thou hast beset me behind and before, and laid thine hand upon me. Great is the mystery of godliness. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain unto it. Like, you know, Paul being caught up to the third heaven and seeing things that it's not lawful for a man to utter, yet that little Colin Burpo kid can come down and talk about how he's been to heaven, Jesse Duplantis and all these weirdos, I've seen God, been to heaven, you shut up. Yeah. Verse 7. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or... Whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. I mean, God's everywhere. Who do you think runs hell? It, it isn't Satan. Okay? If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand, reference unto our Lord Jesus Christ, shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me, yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. Do we really, do we really understand just how big God is? See, a lot of the problem is a lot of people like to make God into their own little image and confine God to a little Mary statue or to a Buddha statue or to the Pucharist cookie that they worship. Um, God is far bigger than our little finite minds can imagine. Heaven is his throne. The earth is his footstool. What house will you build me, he says. But yet, as big as God is, Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. All that bigness contained in one unit, so that means that all the bigness of God it doesn't exist unless it was in just, no. Great is the mystery of godliness, dear friend. I, I, I'm, I'm, I, I, I read this, okay? But yet I still can't comprehend just how huge God is. And see, our problem is that we like to think we're as big as God is or make God down to our size. Thou thoughtest I, I was altogether such a one as thyself. That's Psalm 50, I believe. But see, God was like us in that he was manifest in flesh, but he never sinned. He can't sin. The temptation that our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, endured and suffered was temptation against the flesh. Not himself personally, but the flesh, you see. The flesh. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. The flesh profiteth nothing. So God on the cross as a man, and as we read in Psalm 22, because he 
was found in fashion as a man. He had the feelings of a man. Okay? You know, Jesus wept. He got angry because he had a cause. Okay? As a man, as we saw in Psalm 22, that's why he said on the cross, My God, my God, why hast, why hast thou forsaken me? Because he was there doing what he was supposed to do. Because God provided himself a lamb for burnt offering. And as a man on the cross, that's why he said that. That's why. I hope that I hope this explanation helps you, brother. I hope so. Um, I hope so. This was a beautiful, uh, beautiful question, and as you've seen, diverted us into several rabbit trails. But yeah, it's going to be it for this video. Um, thank you so much for watching this. If you do, thank you to all you brethren. Uh, Church of the Living God who pray for us. Thank you for your prayers. Please continue to pray for us. Um, please continue to pray for us. We pray for so many of you. We pray for so many of you. Um, also, too, I want to quickly make mention. Um, if I have not gotten to your email, if I have not watched your video yet, um, there's a young man who sent me a video of his testimony that I, I, I have not watched that yet. I'm sorry. Um, we, we have things going on. Okay. Again, if I have not gotten to your email, if I have not gotten to your question, this, <laughs> please continue to be patient with your servant. Okay. Please. Lord willing, we'll get there. Okay. But uh, thank you. Thank you so very much. Thank you our brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. We love you so very much. This is going to be it for this video. And um, hopefully, Lord willing, there will be another video either Sunday or Monday. Um, slowing it down a little bit, a little bit, um, but by no means. <laughs> by no means. Got lots coming yet. Thank you, brother. We love you. Hopefully this has helped. And we will see you in the next video, okay?